Welcome everyone. Um, as you come into the room, feel free to type your name and your community area in a meaningful place to you. Um, that's near or along 95th Street in the chat. We'd like to know who's in the place and what makes 95th Street special to you. I see 96th and King Drive. Um, Ms. Sloan, we do have an ASL interpreter. Um, let me type that in. Um, People are saying that they can't hear me. Um, can I get a confirmation from our team that I'm? I hear you. Okay. I hear you. Okay. I hear you. That's odd. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That was Miss Brule. I responded to her about the ASL. If anyone has, on the team has any updates on the interpreter so that we can share it with um, Miss Ms. Long. Hi, I'm here. I got in. Okay. Um, somebody requested to have me spotlighted um, so they can see. You're spotlighted now. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, Jen, are we good to go? Okay, great. Um, we're gonna head, go ahead and get started, but in the, um, just as we're getting started, we'd like for you to share your name, um, your community area and a meaningful place to you that's on or near 95th Street in the chat. Um, and we'll give some shout outs throughout the presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Robert Wordlaw, who's going to get us started. Thank you. I hope uh, everyone is able to join and hear us. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Wordlaw, and I am the executive director of the Andaleo Institute. On behalf of all the presenters and panelists you will hear from this evening, I would like to first welcome you to this community-changing event. And second, to thank you for taking the time to participate in this evening's event. This is the meeting, and it is the beginning of a planning process that will rely heavily on your input and participation. The community changes that I referred to earlier will come from the people in the community. Over the next several meetings and months, you will be discussing what is happening and what could and should happen along the two mile stretch of 95th Street from Halstead to Cottage Grove. What 95th Street will be comprised of now and in the future will be based on the input and recommendation of you the people impacted by the changes. Those changes will impact in some way all of the far south side community that so often have been the victims of change rather than the beneficiary of change. This inclusionary process, planning process, is being implemented to ensure that the people of those far south side communities benefit economically, culturally, and socially from any changes that 
occurred as, as a result of this planning process. Some of the changes you will be considering may have immediate short-term effect. Others may benefit your children or your grandchildren, your neighbors or other relatives. To live and raise a family with the 95th Street being the hub of that change. And 95th Street also being the model for which other thoroughfares in our far south side community can emulate. I am now pleased to introduce Ms. Catania Rady of the Far South Side Development Corp. She will give some additional introductory and informational remarks. Ms. Raby. Thank you so much, Mr. Wordlaw. Um, I too am extremely excited to be with you all tonight. Um, so we wanna give you all a very warm welcome on this kind of cold day. Um, and thank you for coming out to learn more about the 95th Street Corridor Plan. Um, I am Katanya Raby, the Vice President of Planning and Development at Far South Community Development Corporation. And we are truly delighted to see such a diverse and engaged group of people here today as we embark on an exciting journey to shape the future of this community and ensure it thrives for generations to come. Our gathering here tonight is not merely a meeting. It is a celebration of progress, inclusivity, and community empowerment. It is a testament to the values that underpin our vision for a better and more equitable future for all residents along 95th Street. As we convene on this occasion, we recognize that the success of equitable transit-oriented development hinges on collaboration, inclusivity, and the active involvement of the community. We believe that every voice matters, and it is through your insights, experiences, and ideas that we can build a corridor that truly serves everyone's needs. The 95th Street Corridor has the potential to become a model of sustainability, accessibility, and economic growth. Tonight, we have an opportunity to engage in a dialogue that will shape the foundation of our community's future, and your contributions are pivotal to this endeavor. We are here to listen to your concerns, gather your input, and join forces to create a vision that reflects the aspirations and needs of our community. I'd also at this time like to give a quick shout out to Alderman Harris, who I hear is on, uh, online with us tonight. So thank you for joining us. Um, and if there are any other elected officials in this space um, and other community leaders, I'd like to also give you a shout out as well. And thank you for joining us. Um, so to the whole group, thank you guys for being here tonight and let us move forward together hand in hand to create a brighter and more equitable future for 95th Street. Um, given current events locally and globally, uh, we'd like to just take a moment of silence so that we can um, reflect and remember those whom we have lost in this community and beyond. Thank you. At this time, um, I'd also like for you all to know that this meeting is being recorded and it will be made available for future view viewing online. The purpose of this meeting is to begin the process to foster equitable transit oriented development or ETOD, which we'll learn more about um, throughout this presentation along 95th Street between Halstead and Cottage Grove Avenue. During this meeting, we will talk about the launching of the 95th Street Corridor planning process. We'll also introduce ourselves and the teams and all of the um, folks that are involved in the development of this plan. We'll talk about how we got here. We'll also discuss what equitable transit oriented development is and what it means for 95th Street. 
uh, we'll talk about what we're doing to build on previous efforts that were made uh, along in, within this area. We'll discuss the plan and scope, the plan scope and the timeline. And then we'll also make sure that you don't leave here without knowing how you can be involved in the process. So it's important for us to establish some guiding principles for our meetings. And so these are a couple of rules of engagement that we've developed um, that have been developed through these equitable transit oriented development processes. And we'd like to share them with you um, just to help us get started. So we like to check for diversity gaps and see who's missing in this space and propose solutions for it. We are mindful of speaking time to avoid a few people dominating the meeting. We embrace different communication styles, especially the ones farther apart from ours. We actively pursue engagement of less vocal members. We are aware of our power and our privilege. We give and receive feedback, criticism, and questioning. We assume good faith. We listen with an open mind and we seek multiple points of view. So the people that you'll hear from today include myself and my colleagues that are uh, listed on the screen. So we have Jasmine Gunn, who is with the Department of Planning and Development, Quinn Casal, who is with the Chicago Transportation Authority, uh, Dr. Kirk Harris and Hubert Morgan, along with Dr. Uh, Mr. Wordlaw, who are with the Andaleo Institute, Tina Francois Blue, who is with Francois Blue Consulting, and Kimberly Rudd of Rudd Resources. We also have team members from our consulting agencies that are helping us with this plan. AECOM, Layton Design, Urban Works, GSG, and Muse Community and Design. So we also wanna know who you guys are and who's in this room with us. So we wanna know where you guys are coming from, where do you live, where do you work? And we're not gonna to get too detailed on that. We just wanna know high level, what community area do you live or work in? So this is a polling opportunity. So you'll see, um, you should see on your screen, a window that popped up. If you're using a computer, um, there should be a window that popped up with uh, multiple choice answers to select from. If you are using a cell phone, you may have to swipe to see the polling questions. I'm not sure if they pop up in the same fashion that they do on a computer screen. If you have any trouble with accessing the poll, um, you can chat um, and one of our team members can try to assist as best as we can. Um, but if, if you're not able to respond to the poll, that's okay too. Uh, there are other ways for us to capture this information. So um, we asked what community area do you live in? Um, these are the community areas that are most closely tied to the 95th Street corridor. So there's Washington Heights, Roseland, Chatham, Auburn Gresham, Burnside, and Pullman. There's a, the second question is, sorry, what is your zip code? And those options are 60619, 60620, 60628, and 60643. The third question asks to tell us what connects you to this community? And you can select as many as you like. This is multiple choice. Um, you, do you live here? Do you work or own, own a business here? Your kids or you go to school here? You use public transportation in this community? You go to church or are involved in a local community organization or other? The fourth question. Can you go to the next slide? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. The The poll has a, a, a list of of all of the polling questions. So I'm, I apologize. So we're, we'll ask the other questions later on in the presentation.
So if you've had a chance to respond to the poll, um, that helps us to just get a better sense of who's in the room. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to see the results I thought I would be so that I could share them back. But if there's an opportunity later in the presentation to share back um, those poll results, then we will do that later in the presentation. Um, so now that we know, have kind of shared who's in this space, I'd like to turn it over to Quinn Casal, who is with CTA, who is going to share with us um, about the uh, the support for the 95th Street Corridor that's already taking place and the grant funding that um, helped us to make sure that we can do this planning process. All right, thank you so much, Katanya, for, for starting us off. Good evening, everyone. What a great turnout for this first meeting that we're having. My name is Quinn Casal. I'm a strategic planner with the Chicago Transit Authority. We're here tonight, as you heard from Bob, to talk about the start of a community-led plan to guide future equitable transit-oriented development, or ETOD, along two miles of 95th Street. Now, we will elaborate more on exactly what that means shortly, um, but we first wanted to thank some of the folks that have helped us secure the federal grant funds that are making this work possible to begin with. Uh, in 2022, the Federal Transit Administration, or FTA, announced that the CTA and the Chicago Department of Planning and Development, or DPD, would be awarded $800,000 from the FTA's pilot program for transit-oriented development. This is being matched with local funds from the city of Chicago for a total $1 million budget for the planning process. While DPD and the CTA were the applicants for this grant, we were very fortunate to have many of the parties listed on this slide assist us by writing support letters to the federal government and collaborating on the grant application directly. The FTA's grant program is very competitive, and we understand that this community support was crucial towards us receiving the grant to ultimately do this work. With that said, I'd like to thank Congressman Jackson and former Congressman Rush, Senators Durbin and Duckworth, Alderman Hall, Harris, Beal, Mosley, and former Alderman Brookins, the Andaleo Institute, Elevated Chicago, the Metropolitan Planning Commission, the Roseland Heights Community Association, Chicago Community Trust, Far South CDC, Chicago State University, the Trinity United Church of Christ, the Chicago Department of Transportation, Metra, PACE, and the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. So that was a lot of people to thank, but we also now have additional supported groups that will be helping champion this planning process as we go along. We will thank them in advance. Um, now, the 95th Street corridor that we're talking about is this two-mile stretch between Halstead on the west and Cottage Grove on the east. The reason that we're looking at this stretch specifically is because it ties together five major public transit investments that are either completed already or are planned to be in the near future. We'll briefly go through each one. The first investment is at the 95th Street Red Line Station, where CTA in 2019 completed a $280 million reconstruction of the terminal, providing a spacious and modern facility to accommodate the thousands of riders that pass through every day. This is one of CTA's busiest stations and provides bus connections to all across the far south side. The second investment is CTA's Red Line Extension. CTA is proposing to extend the Red Line, Chicago's most traveled rail line, an additional 5.6 miles south from 95th Street all the way to 130th Street, including new stations at 103rd, 111th, and Michigan Avenue. The third investment is Metra's upcoming reconstruction of the 95th Street Chicago State University Station. This station is on the Metro Electric Line, 95th and Cottage Grove, and connects the 95th Street corridor with many areas across the region, including downtown Chicago, Hyde Park, and the south suburbs. Metro is planning to rehabilitate and transform the station, including accessibility for people with disabilities and a new park and ride facility. The final two investments will improve bus service along 95th Street and South Halsted Street. They will provide faster and more frequent service with limited stops on some lines, bus stations with additional amenities over the existing bus stops, new buses with Wi-Fi, and other improvements. These two investments are known as the Pace Pulse 95th Street Line, which is an effort from our friends at Pace Suburban Bus, 
and the South Halsted Bus Corridor Enhancement Project, which PACE and CTA have been working on together. So the key takeaway from these five transit investments and the reason that we're talking about them is that what these improvements will do is bring people together along 95th Street. Improved transit access provides increased access to opportunities. And with this corridor serving as a hub between these transit improvements, we see an important opportunity to envision potential growth that could address community needs. And the ETOD framework is how we can accomplish that in an equitable and sustainable way. So to tell us more about what ETOD actually is and what it could look like on 95th, I will now turn it over to Jasmine Gunn, the project manager with DPD. Thank you all. Thank you, Quinn. Um, hello, as you mentioned, my name is Jasmine Gunn and I am a planner with the Department of Planning and Development for the Far South region. Um, as Quinn mentioned, um, there's really a total of billions of dollars worth of investment in transit along this corridor, which really represents an exciting opportunity. Um, what ETOD means is equitable transit oriented development. And it's a concept where every Chicagoan, regardless of your identity or your background, should be able to live in a healthy, walkable, vibrant, connected community and connected to transit and all of its benefits. Um, ETODs are development or buildings close to bus and train stops that make living in the area better for all. It's accessible to amenities and new activities for residents and has housing, work, and play spaces. And also important is that ETOD does not price anyone out and it is welcoming to everyone. So I, next I wanna go over some of the goals of ETOD or equitable transit oriented development. The first is investing in disinvested communities. In 2020, the city of Chicago underwent a study for ETOD and they found that TOD, which means transit oriented development was really happening 90% on the north side, the northwest side, downtown and the west loop. So barely no development was happening around transit in the south and west sides. That's where the equity came into place, just how to have more equity and more development throughout the entire city. Um, so a goal of ETOD is to invest in communities that have not been invested in and to prevent displacement in communities with rising housing costs. Another goal of ETOD is to promote affordable housing and to build community wealth. An example shown on the screen here is 43 Green. It's a building that recently opened. Um, it has one, it's a 10 story building, includes 99 units of housing, 50 or half of which are affordable. And there's a large number of resident amenities as seen here, including space for children and then open deck space and community space. And then there's also 5,500 square feet of retail space for local and minority owned businesses, such as Clio Southern Cuisine, which was a local minority owned business that actually got a grant from the city to build out space in this development. So this is just an example of what equitable transit oriented development could look like in your communities. There's some other examples of ETODs um, and other goals. It includes walkable people-centered neighborhoods and delivering community resources and amenities needed for residents to thrive. Some other examples are the Green Line Performing Arts Center, which is a, a, a theater right off the Green Line. Then there's Pop Courts, which is a, a beautiful plaza space for people to come together and safely gather. And then there's a Chicago Market Co-op, which is a group of neighbors who came together to do a co-op grocery store at the Wilson L stop, and that's under development now. So these are just some examples of what ETOD could look like um, in the goals expressed. So some of the benefits of equitable transit-oriented development are that you can save on household transportation costs, at least 10, 000, up to 10,000 a year. It's access to 25, 24 to 50% more jobs and opportunities throughout the city and the region. Retail sales uh, could be up to 88% higher at businesses located near trains and pedestrian friendly areas. 
and then health improvements, including up to three times lower obesity rates among adults who walk, bike, or use transit, and then household transportation costs um, emissions could be up to 78% lower. So it's also sustainable and environmentally friendly as well. So as a recap, the study area generally includes uh, the 95th Street corridor from Cottage Grove to Halstead and all the neighborhoods and community areas in between. And this is just a map of what that uh, plan area looks like. So for this 95th Street corridor plan, I kind of wanted to qu quickly go over what the scope is. For those that maybe joined the meeting in January, um, this is a, a small recap. But we have a community engagement and ownership piece where we have community partners who are on our on the line here today um, and a number of community meetings, focus groups and opportunities to really hear community voice and to have community voice drive the concepts created in this plan. We have an existing conditions and market analysis. So we're studying the buildings and the businesses and everything that's here now that we will go over with everyone. We have land use and zoning. So looking at the uses of the land throughout the corridor and what kind of zoning changes or zoning updates we need to be had. Economic development, looking at job training or um, new business development to create economic activity along the corridor. Multimodal connectivity is looking at all of the transit and mobility options and how to connect the different transit projects as well as improve infrastructure. And then we have design guidelines and development concepts, which will imagine or create a vision based on the community vision. We'll visualize buildings and new developments along the corridor. And then finally, we'll have a final plan document that will be um, presented to the plan commission to be adopted by the city as well. So we realize uh, some of you may have planning fatigue because we this community um, in this area has had a lot of planning happening. Um, we see this really as a continuation of those planning efforts, building on the momentum and really bringing forth projects and, and bringing forth uh, new activity in the communities. So we did wanna take time to acknowledge and highlight some of the planning activities and community engagement that has happened throughout the corridor, um, including the Washington Heights and 95th Street planning efforts in 2016, the Imani Village uh, plan development, the Far South Chicago Quality of Life plan that is still underway as well, um, the Rosa Medical District plan, and then this past year, the Chicago State University uh, 95th Development Framework plan, as well as the Red Line Extension Transit Supportive Development plan that were both passed this year in 2023. So we wanna take a moment just to highlight some of the priorities that were identified in the community plans and then to hear from you guys, what are some priorities that you have for your community as well? So the first is housing. Uh, we heard people wanna maintain and provide affordability for housing, have a diversity of housing types and expand opportunities to grow families throughout the corridor. commercial spaces and local businesses, we definitely heard a strong desire to strengthen 95th Street as a branded and recognizable community destination, and then to support local businesses development along the main commercial corridor for economic development, employment, and wealth building opportunities, and to serve some of the shopping needs and other amenities that residents would like to see. So the other is vacant seas and vacant lots. So repurposing vacant and abandoned buildings and doing development without displacement by looking at these vacant buildings and vacant land as priorities for redevelopment. And then transit access. So improving transit, walking and biking infrastructure and the connectivity between all of the transit projects that Quinn mentioned are happening along the corridor. And then civic health education and religious institutions. So um, just building up the community health and safety, uh, looking at healthy food access, healthcare services, mental health and access to nature and open space. And then also leveraging community partnerships for community development. 
So I don't know if we have a poll question or you can put in the chat as well. Um, just what are your priorities for your community? Your top two priorities. And there should be a poll question that comes on your screen here. And the options for the poll are housing and equitable development, economic vitality and local jobs, walkability or public space, health services and amenities, community voices, and other. So take time to kind of choose your top two choices. And if there's other, if you don't mind, maybe putting in the chat what your other priorities are. And I see in the chat now, um, economic mobility and jobs and housing, healthy food and grocery store, walkability, healthy eating establishes, and some more walkability, economic vitality, jobs, and excellent architecture and design community voice, safety, walkability. All right, we'll give the poll a few more seconds here. All right, so the top uh, three choices uh, the first was economic vitality and local jobs. The second was housing and equitable development. And the third was walkability and public space. Great, thank you guys. So um, one, one thing I did not mention in the scope of this plan is that we are conducting a health and racial equity assessment as a part of this um, impact assessment, as a part of this planning process. So next I'm going to pass it off to Tina, who's gonna explain kind of what that concept is and how it will look in this project. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Tina Francois Blue. It is an honor to be with you tonight discussing a topic that I am fiercely passionate about. Um, for over 20 years, I've dedicated my career in public health and now as an entrepreneur and co-founder of Francois Blue Consulting to advancing equity and social justice for Black communities and communities of color. So we've heard the term equitable and equity used several times tonight. And some of you may, may be familiar with what that means. And for some of you, you may not. So I wanna begin by just kind of sharing a quick analogy that'll help ground us in having a shared understanding of what equity is. So can we all agree that everyone has a right to education, right? Um, what if a teacher walked into her classroom and handed her class a lesson for the day just on a piece of paper and then went to sat down and just said, okay, here you go. This is, the, this is your education for the day. And well, for some, that may, may be enough, but certainly not for all. We all have different ways in which we learn. Some of us are visual. Some of us, are, you know, here we, we learn by um, what we hear. Some of us learn by what we write. But essentially, equity in this scenario would involve the use of a number of different, a variety of different modalities to be able to meet the needs of all diverse learners. <clears throat> it's important for us to understand that unlike equality efforts, equity actually acknowledges that we are and our lived experiences are different in ways that are important. And each of us need access to resources and opportunities that are tailored for those specific needs. Equity as an outcome is the, the absence of unfair or avoidable or remediable differences amongst groups of people, whether those groups are um, defined by their sex, their gender, their, eth their ethnicity, their disability, <clears throat> they shouldn't be, um, there should be no differences 
in the receipt of or the, the receipt of resources and or access to those opportunities based on any of those factors. And we know that historically that has been the case and that living conditions have been made worse because of discrimination, because of stereotyping, because of um, institutional and system systemic processes that have limited access to certain things, to certain groups and provided um, far more access to those same resources for others. In this process, we will make sure that we are advancing not only equity overall, but also health equity specifically in that it's the attainment of the fullest potential of one's health and well-being, for making sure that there's access to um, all of the resources, health uh, services, health insurance, and so on and so forth, that actually allows uh, an individual to be able to, um, to maintain their own well-being. Same thing with racial equity. As a, as a process, racial equity is the elimination of those disparities and that <clears throat> involving outcomes for everyone. Equity as a whole, it is the intentional and ongoing practice of, of changing policies and practices and systems and structures by prioritizing measurable change in the lives of people of color. Equity is a measure of justice and advancing that justice. We are <clears throat> using the health, health and health and racial equity impact assessment as our roadmap to achieving ETOD, equitable transit oriented development along the 95th Street corridor. We will ensure that <clears throat> as a process and as an outcome, that as a process, we will be using an as asset-based process. We will be, the process itself will be ongoing, meaning that it's not just one thing that we're doing one time. It is something that will be going on throughout the entire, that's something that we will be doing in terms of activities, but something that we will be um, pulling through from the start of the project to the, to the end of the project that it ensures not only the information that we're learning through the data that we're gathering, but also it pulls through to the lessons learned and the plans that we're creating in the future. As a, as a, as a cycle, cyclical, that means that we will be gathering information, assessing that information, analyzing it, and then engaging with you to be able to share it, to learn from you, to get information about how these things have impacted you, and then to continue that, that, that cycle of learning from, from what we're finding and then using that information to move things forward. As an outcome, we're making sure that there are some really important things that the ways in which we're defining equity in this, in this project. And one of those things is ensuring that there is an elevated cultural identity. Many people have different views about what the South Side is or who this community is. And so we wanna make sure that your voices are determining who you are, like we're, that we are elevating your voices and how you're defining who you are as a community. And that is put forward in everything that we do. And it is put forward in the, the, the plans that will come forth from this project. Also that there's an, an acknowledgement and an atonement for those things that have been promised to you and have never been, have never come to fruition. And also we are, we are, ensuring that there are there will be opportunities for self-determination along the avenues in which you just um, provided through the previous. A very, uh, I would say almost one of the most important components of this is that as a priority of the health and racial equity impact assessment, Building community power is essential. It is core. It is the one of the key factors as to how we will actually advance equity and achieve equity in this project. Each of you should have an ability to be able to have a greater influence and control over the plans and decisions and the public services that you see when you walk out of your door or when you come to work or when you're coming to patronize the businesses that are along this area. You should be able to actually have a say in some of the, the businesses that are, are that are available or some of the jobs that are available in your community. And that is what we are working to uh, working with, with you and working to ensure on your behalf as a result of this um, throughout this project. We, as a, as a priority, and to be able to build community power, we will be empowering the communities itself to be able to, as a result, flourish and be happier and healthier as, as um, being able to have more determination in the things that you're, that we're seeing in the plans that are, that will be developed down the road. And then ultimately building community power builds resilience and cohesion as a community, another goal of this project. So specifically, the <clears throat> what uh, the health and racial equity impact assessment is, 
this is a we have a framework for how we will then assess, analyze, evaluate, and then engage with the project. So this framework has six focus areas. So those focus areas are empowered community voices, community wealth building, safety and mobility, health and wellness, equitable development, and environment. And then there are the multiple measures underneath each one of these focus areas that we will be doing, taking a deeper dive and, and gathering additional data. And that data will come in varying sources. Um, from And, and importantly, uh, one of those sources, again, is directly from you all. And we'll be using that information to create a comprehensive picture of how these different factors and these different focus areas impact not only your you know day to day life, but impact your ability to to attain any of the things in this in these areas. For example, we will be doing a deeper dive into educational access, economic development, and job opportunities. And so, with that, using that information to then understand, based on that data, what are some of the things that are driving driving that? And then, if there's any cross, um, if there are impacts related to if so lack of things that are or either lack of or asset-based things that are existing in one factor, such as health or wellness, does that also have an impact in um, some of the other areas? So we'll be just doing a deeper dive to just really understand what are those specific things that are in, that are driving and impacting in both the positive and the negative way, what the lived experience is around, along the 95th Street corridor so that we can ultimately pull all of those lessons learned into the shaping shaping the uh, future plans for this year. So I wanna pause, I just gave a, a lot of great information, but I wanna pause now because I'm sure there's a lot of things floating around and I wanna give an opportunity for you all to ask us some questions. If you have any questions, please place all of your questions for Ms. Sina in the Q&A portion. Thank you. Tina, there's a question from an anonymous attendee. It reads, I am curious why community voice is an option and not part of the process. I would say community voice is not, it's it's both. Community voice very much so is a, it's a, it is a part of the process and it is a, a factor. So underneath, it, can we actually go back to the previous slide to see the focus area? Can we bring that on the page? So community voice, we're looking at that as a, uh, to be able to think about the different types of information that we are gathering to be able to understand what community voice is. This is these are just three different ways, but as we hear from you, actually the community in like through this the public sec the um this public meeting and we'll have other opportunities for the community to to share their voice not only through other uh, future public meetings but online and through social media it is very we're being very intentional about giving as many different ways to hear from you because your voice is critical we have to be able to understand what is how are you defining what's important and how do you define what how many of the these things, how has that actually impacted you on a very real and profound level? Looking at data um, that's gathered from a survey or that's gathered from the health department, that's one, but actually hearing what that means in real life is something very different. And we need to understand both of those things to make sure that we are pulling through this information and, and the plans that will be developed that takes into consideration all of those and all, all of that information. Thank you for, for, sharing, for asking that question. It's a very, very important. Thank you, Tina. There's another question we'd like to elevate for you. Will, this is from um, Stanny Wills. Will this plan have an opportunity for youth to participate and give input around their public safety needs? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, it's a, a really important thing and thank you for, for raising that question. Um, everyone's voice in the community is, is valued as an important, but given the fact that we're talking about economic opportunities, we're talking about um, educational attainment, we're talking about all of these different things, youth are critical. The ways in which our society are changing, um, 
there are many things that as um, adults, those things are the, that we have known to be true over you know our time growing up that don't even exist. How um, job opportunities and how things are advancing based of you know um, AI and technology, our youth have to be a part of those conversations to not only understand how where do they fit in all of this, but we just need to understand their their experiences. Where do they want to see themselves? What do they need in order to to make this um, real and actual and tangible for them? So absolutely, youth are very important, and we'll be um, sharing with you. Along the along the way, who are some of those other priority groups that we want to make sure that we that we hear from? Because um, there are certainly some folks that are speak louder than others, and we welcome that. But we also want to make sure that some individual individuals who may feel, well, I'm not really sure if my voice is important. I'm just here to, here to tell you that your voice is absolutely important. If you have, if you live in this area, if you patronize this area, if you have any um, experience with along this corridor, then we want to hear from you. That's very important for us. Another uh, question from an anonymous attendee. What is meant by education access for residents? Will residents receive access to information related to wealth building and grants? That's a very good question. So under as a as as a measure underneath this focus area, so that's one of the um, things that we will be doing a deeper deeper dive under. So looking at um, what's the the like the proportion of um, folks who are accessing education across uh, you know high school, elementary school, you know college, and so on and so forth. So we'll be looking at diff different types of data sources, but as a um, as an outcome. If, they're, if the community itself is saying that we need to have access to information about how we're attaining ad additional, even adult education uh, related to whatever that is. Um, if, we, if you want additional information about grants that are available and you need not only just information about it, if the, but if you need additional resources to be able to complete some of those applications, those are the things that we would wanna know from the community and we'll be asking questions to be able to gauge specifically how you want to see that. And so we can pull it through and, and, and think about ways that we can pull, um, ensure that those things are provided to you. Thank you for that question. Can I add to that question that if uh, the questioner had some, has some present concerns about education, they can contact uh, Andaleo and we have some people that are very well informed on education and grants, loans, and so on. Uh, so you can contact our office, and uh, we will make sure that you get the information that you need. Thank you. Kina, another question from Jamila Jordan. It reads, how will key performance indicators, or KPIs, be determined for each of the focus areas or the process. Thank you. Thank you. So once we, we'll be gathering data along each one of these metrics, and then we'll be creating um, an index, essentially, that will then kind of fold back, not to get too technical, but essentially it'll fold back up to measures, uh, fold back up to an index that will allow us to then be able to use a ranking of, you know, um, how, so how has this, how has, you know, this information how has the community been impacted in with respect to, let's say, safety and mobility or, or around access to transit specifically, the different um, data sources that we're pulling around transit? Um, has that been, has it been equal access? Has it been ac access, uh, differ differential access based upon um, whether a person is a resident versus a renter, whether that person, um, you know, just different factors that may impact, you know, their ability for, let's say, and then around public safety. So there is a number of different things that we'll be doing a deeper dive on around safety itself. But essentially, um, the information that we're gathering in each one of these, we'll fold it back up and we'll be creating an index that we'll use to be able to, to create a, 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 a scale that we can then share with the community to be able to sh you know show back to say, okay, this is how, this is what we found and this is how the um, the uh, what the scale is saying, you know, based upon the data source and then how, if there's any, again, um, 
in cross impact. So it's health, the safety impact, health and well, you know, health and wellness does, um, you know, equitable, equitable uh, development is that impacting uh, community wealth building. So we'll we'll be looking at all of those things, uh, doing a further analysis, looking at all of those things, and then we will also be sharing this information. So I want to make sure that I. Um, uh, uh, reiterate the fact that please continue to, to check the website because we will be sharing information as we're um, get, as the data is being compiled and and disseminated the website is one of the key places to stay abreast of the findings that are coming out of the health and racial equity impact assessment and then also it's a way for you to continue to give feedback to the information that we're sharing our final question for this segment comes from john paul jones it reads Thank you for your equity initiative. How can we best approach the youth internship opportunities and get to the larger acknowledgement quest under equity? That's uh, so, uh, um, Kimberly, re can you uh, repeat the question again for me, please? Sure. How can we best approach the youth internship opportunities and how can we get to the larger acknowledgement quest under equity? I'm going to handle, I think, the second uh, part of that first, because I think the, the youth internship opportunities, um, there we are, well, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that part first. The We are very thoughtful, and we are being, the plan, the planning team, we are very being very thoughtful about the ways in which we want to engage you. So please, again, check the website and check uh, our, our social, you know, uh, check our social media sites for future opportunities, because there probably will, there'll be some focus group um, focus group opportunities that are available for them to share. And then as a result of that, there may be some additional opportunities for um, for internships and or volunteer opportunities for different aspects of this project, um, especially anyone who is interested, any of the youth who are interested in working with me on the, um, the racial equity impact assessment component and doing uh, learning some additional skills in that way. Please keep a, an eye out for additional information. That. But in terms of the acknowledgement, Excuse me. Again, that, I think that that's an ongoing process. So where it starts first is we're right now in the midst of an existing condition study. So we're doing the deeper dive into really understanding the past, understanding findings from the you know previous reports that have been done to really understand what has been that actual impact from the disinvestment that has occurred over the last you know many many years. That acknowledgement first is coming from and, and being very transparent and real about what those things are saying. What are, what are we actually finding? And to be able to, to point directly to, well, the dis disinvestment actually impacted the community in this way and in this way and in this way. And to not be shy from, you know, just calling a spade a spade, essentially, and being thoughtful of, OK, now that we're acknowledging what that real impact is, how are we going to do different things? How are we going to ensure that th that this we don't see again? And how do we ensure that we're not just doing things and speak and uh, and just talking on in nice meetings like this? But how do we make sure that our that as a community and that you your voice is heard and that you can at the end of the day actually see in the plans that we come up with? Oh, I remember that was something that came out of that first public meeting. I remember I made a comment about that. It's good for me to be able to see that they were actually paying attention. I want to also say the acknowledgement will come, we're accessible. So we will be accessible through varying means to be able to gain insight and information from you. And so we want along this process, if you are starting to see something that doesn't feel right or doesn't feel like it is that we're, you know, following an equitable process, this doesn't look like equity to me, then we, I, I would like, and I would encourage everybody to hold us to, you know, hold us to charge. Um, and definitely you can hold me to charge. And I think that, that that is an important difference in, in perhaps how things have been done in the past, but this is a critical component of the work that we're doing for moving forward. So thank you, thank you for that, that um, those comments. And so now I would like to turn this opportunity, turn uh, the time over to uh, Dr. Kirk. And then again, any, any uh, future comments or any additional comments, please go to the website and um, follow us on social media. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Tina, so very much. Uh, good evening, family. 
Good evening, community. Um, I'm Dr. Kirk Harris. I'm a professor of urban planning and community development, and I'm an urban planning consultant for Endaleo and the Trinity uh, United Church of Christ. And I work uh, with my longtime colleague and partner, Hubert Morgan, who you'll be hearing from in a little bit. Um, been working in areas uh, related to uh, Black communities for over 25 years, and am very excited about what I think is going to be a historic opportunity to leverage enormous uh, transportation investment and build a sustainable and promising future for the 95th Street Corridor. Um, but we need you, all of those of you who are on the uh, uh, Zoom today, we need you to participate and you, we need you to hold the process accountable to the community interest and community priorities that emerge. Uh, planning as an exercise is about producing a document that says, here's some ideas about what we're going to move forward on. But the way those ideas get articulated and prioritized and put into action is about you and the, what you do after this process is over. And to that end, we are very much interested in establishing a vehicle for ensuring the long-term accountability to this planning process uh, that the community can leverage as a way of ensuring their interests are carried out, not just now in this planning process, but actually over the course of any number of activities that will happen as the plans get implemented and the community holds accountable for that implementation. And so this community table uh, that we're uh, suggesting as the vehicle is a mechanism by which we engage community in a very representative way across uh, those communities that are abutting and close to and around the corridor and making sure that they're represented on the table to ensure that their voice is heard. And this is part of the way uh, and I know Tina tried to respond to this, is part of the way that we're going to ensure that community voice is central to this exercise and that youth voice is central to these exercises because uh, we're going to make sure that this community table brings those voices into the fore through this community table mechanism. So um, we consider this as, a, as an important vehicle, and I should also give uh, acknowledgement that the community table idea is something that has been brought out through the work of Elevated Chicago, and it's been engaged through other communities, but it's we're using it in a very unique way, scaling it up in a way that it hasn't been used before that we think is going to be very important to this process. So when we think about the community table, the structure and the principles, what we really need to think about is who and how are we going to make this community table come alive? And one way we do that is ensure that we have trusted community leaders who will serve as representatives uh, of the community wisdom and lived experience. The other way that we are going to ensure this community table is, um, is engaged and, and doing its work is we're gonna ensure that it's gonna be self-governing and that it represents a broad set of community interests across the corridor. And we're gonna make sure that the work of the community table is transparent, democratic, and serves as a foundation and is uh, for the leading edge on the equity issues that we've just heard a great deal about. So, what are the responsibilities and functions of the community table? What we want the folks who are sitting on this community table to do is to act as tr community, trusted community leaders and leverage their networks for reaching into the community to engage the participation of community members. So we're, when we're looking at the community table and we're recruiting folks to that table, we're really interested in ensuring that those folks actually leverage and activate those networks to advance and bring to scale the involvement and connections of community to this planning process. And secondly, what we recognize is that there's a number of um, technical issues that may be emergent and will be emergent in this planning process. And we believe in order for the community table members to be sufficiently um, 
knowledgeable, they have to be provided with information and support around those technical elements so that they can do their best work in representing the community and, and ensuring, as my colleague says, you know, leveraging that best work in a way that ensures that the outcomes uh, are really about the community and just about the community and its, and its implications. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to my longtime distinguished brother and colleague, Hubert Morgan. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Hubert Morgan. Thanks for that, Kirk. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this. Um, I am a long range planner by practice. I live in the community um, and this is absolutely meaningful to me. Um, Tina mentioned uh, something that um, is so critical to what we are trying to lift up here, building community power. And this planning process it's all about how do we get residents who live along the corridor to be at the center of the decision making, um, the decision making process over the next fifteen months. So, if I'm if I live here and I want to be on this community table, uh, what does it what does that actually mean? Um, well, first of all, we want you to think about this from a civic perspective. If you live along the corridor in the communities that I'm about to mention, we want you to seriously think about what it would take for you to share some time with us. So there are Chicago community areas like Pullman, Roseland, and Washington Heights. If you live here, that's the first way that you can qualify. If you're in one of the neighborhoods that are nestled in these Chicago community areas, West Chesterfield, and I know that Eli is here. I saw his name flash by. Um, Cottage Grove Heights, Rosemore, um, Burnside, Fernwood, Longwood Manor, Ivy Park Homes, and Loudon Homes. If you live here in one of these neighborhoods, this is a qualifier for you to be able to do that. But we're also asking a little bit more of you because we need you to have the relationship with the rest of your community to be able to leverage that, that the community as a whole can look to you, that you're representing our best interests. Um, we also are looking for people who are leaders in, in the community, not just today and going forward, but yesterday and what has taken us to this point. Another criteria that was just mentioned is youth. Believe me, we are planning not only for today, but we're planning for our kids and our grandkids. So we are actually having a couple of seats at the community table for youth. We are actually having a youth table where it's only youth who get the opportunity to participate. Why? Because too often, when youth and adults sit at the same table, youth don't get the respect that they should and are not able to vocalize their issues in a way that they should. So we're going to have a table where they will be able to sit down, discuss and deliberate around the issues that they feel are pressing, and send two representatives from their table to the, to the main table. So we'll get to, we're working with some high schools um, in the area, and we're working with Chicago State to be able to see if young people at Chicago State can be part of this youth entourage. It is also critical that we have people across the diversity of ages, because a lot of the meetings that we go to um, are people who are look like me in terms of their gray. And I can say that. Um, but we need people who are coming out of college, who are working, who are establishing families, who are of that age demographic that is key. So we definitely need um, those people to consider this. And then definitely people with disabilities. So how will this, this all work? Well, the planning process will, will come up with a lot of recommendations, but 
recommendations for who? As Kirk said earlier, this is actually a process that's going to be centered in terms of residents and residents. This is what we need for the community. So how this planning process is actually designed is that the community table will be the this, this sounding board for the planning ideas that come about. And from the community table, there's going to be a handful of people that's going to be referred to as the community advisory group. And that's the group that will work most closely with the planning process. And this graphic tries to illustrate that the community advisory group is a subset of the community table, and it will be an iterative process. They will listen, they'll provide input to the planning process, they'll take it back to the community table because they are gonna be held accountable for representing the community in the planning process. So the role of that group, the community advisory group, is to collaborate with the project team. They're gonna be providing the feedback for all the alternatives when we talk about planning and zoning, when we talk about transportation and things like that. And then Tina mentioned all of this assessment work that's gonna happen. Um, this group will help her to be able to drill down in terms of um, that work. Um, and I mentioned before that there'll be a feedback uh, mechanism to the community table. And then we'll ask the community table to be along with the community advisory group to be the champions of the project. Um, that way the community at large will be kept informed. So, how can I become a part of this if I wanted to be? Um, I would say this, that we want all of you to be involved. We want all of you to be involved because at the very least, if you only have a little bit of time, please, we will be able to send you information and you can check on the website, you can check through social media, but at least you will be, you will recognize that you have trusted relationships with people who are sitting at the community table and all you need to do is receive the information and you'll be good. But if you have a little more time, you can be part of the group that attends meetings, attends meetings and fills out surveys and gives the type of feedback that we need in all of the analysis that we do. If you have yet a little more time, become involved. Become involved in a way that means that, like today, you come to meetings, whether they're virtual or face-to-face, -face, and then we have these other things that the planning professionals will be coming into the community. You can be part of how we interface whether we're doing a corridor tour or focus groups. And then the ultimate way is partnering. Here it is that we will collaborate with you because you are sitting on the community table. You're sitting as part of the community advisory group. And that's the ultimate thing at the moment to collaborate with us. So here is a poll that we would love for you to be able to respond to right now. How would you prefer to be involved? It's multiple choice. I would love to receive newsletters and other project updates. That's one choice. Another choice, I would love to attend public meetings. I'd love to participate in a walking tour if we have one. I would love to volunteer for focus groups also participate in the community table or ultimately collaborate through the community advisory group. Please vote and you can vote and check off multiple um, of these boxes. Um, but I'm going to give you a minute to vote and um, get your choices in.
Has everyone voted? Kirk, this is what we usually do in this. We can say going, going, gone. Okay, um, the tech group just, thank you. Um, so, oh, um, I was gonna read off the results. I don't know if you can still, thank you. Um, attend public meetings, 71% of the attendees today said that's how I would like to show up. Close beside that, 70% is received newsletters. And then um, a number of you, 53% of you said that you'd like to participate in the community table. So um, let us tell you how you can actually do that. Thank you. Um, so here is another poll. What would help you to stay involved? And the reason why we're asking this is because it's a 15 month process. So we need you to cumulatively come to meetings, get information that you can add to the information that you learned from the last meeting, that at the end of the process, you would have cumulatively gotten enough information that you can help us with your perspective or the recommendations that should be done. So what would help you stay involved? Multiple choices again. First, activities held during business hours. Activities held after 6 p.m. Activities on Saturday or Sunday. Activities in person. Virtual events. Help with internet or technology. None of the above. I'm gonna ask you to vote. This is gonna be very helpful for us because we don't want to schedule meetings at times when the most people who want to be the most active can't make it. Um, so, so please, please vote. We're gonna give you a few more seconds. And I am sure that this group is not going to answer none of the above. Can we go for it? Wow. Virtual events, 89%. Um, activities held after 6 p.m. Um, with 61%. And I'm just gonna give a few more activities in person, 49%, and um, activities on Saturday or Sunday, 34%. Um, and I think 1% is insignificant, so I'm glad that no one said none of the above. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, so Kimberly. you're welcome, Hubert. Thank you. Um, so as you've heard, we're starting a year long planning process and we are calling on you all to get involved and stay involved. So we're going to talk in a moment about various ways to get involved. You heard Hubert say it once. We're going to say it twice because it matters. And we want you to be a part of informing the development of this plan and the recommendations. Here you see the year long schedule. There are six public meetings or workshops through the next 12 months where we will come back to you, your neighbors and other community members to share the progress and seek input and feedback. Today is the first public meeting to launch the project. In the next year, 
And in the new year, we will reconvene around existing conditions in the study area. Some of your questions and comments in the chat are about the existing conditions. Bring those to the meetings. In the spring, we look forward to design options for mobility and the public realm. And in the summer, to, to land use and potential development concepts for ETOD sites. A year from now, we intend to celebrate our collective achievement and the plan adoption. So what are our next steps? You can see them here, there are four. First, register, stay involved, sign up at the website so that we can send you information about future activities, virtual, in-person, all of the above. Second, agree to be a leader, apply to be involved in the community table and the, e and the 95th Street ETOD Community Advisory Group. Third, learn more attend the next in-person public meeting. We're gonna hold that in the winter. Visit the website to read more, to study what ETOD is and isn't, and be a part of the existing conditions activities and the HREIA. And fourth, follow us. Follow us on Instagram, follow us at meetings, Stay close to us. We need you to complete this process. You can scan this QR code if you happen to have your cell phone handy to take you right to the site. Now I'm gonna welcome back all of our speakers, Katanya, Huber, Dr. Kirk, Mr. Wordlaw, Jasmine, Quinn, and we're gonna answer some more of those Q&A questions. We answered a lot in the chat, but we're gonna answer some live here. And um, we're going to go to 7.30. That was the promised end of, the, of this uh, meeting. And hopefully we'll try to get through all of the questions. So first up is a question from Larry Nolan. Uh, Jasmine, I think this is for you. Will there be opportunities to expand the ADU ordinance? That's the addition, accessory dwelling unit ordinance in this area and surrounding areas in the future. Yes, I actually like to take this question and the next question from Lauren Lewis regarding the community land trust ordinance. Um, so both of those are policies. So as the scope of this plan, we are looking at different land use and zoning policies to encourage development, um, equitable development throughout the corridor. So those are definitely um, two policies that we will be looking at. And we'll be looking at a number of policies for precedence and as a precedent <laughs> and evaluating what policies and, and initiatives can happen along this corridor to promote that. Thank you, thank you. Um, this next question, let's ask Quinn to take this. It's from uh, Butler Adams. How can the redevelopment of this corridor truly activate the 95th Street Metro Electric Station? As of now, it's toward the bottom in terms of daily usage numbers. Quinn is with CTA, but you're also with public transit. Hopefully you can answer this. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I would look at that from a few different angles. Uh, the first one is that um, Chicago State University obviously is a major center um, that there may be a lot of people that might be taking transit now, but um, the station reconstruction and revitalization will provide increased amenities that would encourage use of it for people that may already be taking it today, such as um, the improved accessibility, uh, better weather protection, um, just a more comfortable experience overall. Uh, secondly, the e ETOD framework and planning um, would I ideally encourage future development that would sort of attract people to the corridor and make it a hub, um, which would increase increased use of it as well as a sort of a destination for the community. Um, and then the other thing I would just mention is uh, Chicago State University also released their own economic development plan recently that um, I would encourage you to to look into online, but a lot of the planning that they are doing um, also would, would support more use of, of that Metro Electric Station. Um, so those are definitely some things to look forward to and the potential that that station might have. And one other thing I would add to um, is currently it's a flag stop and once it's renovated, it will be an actual stop along. So that will also promote more ridership along the corridor as well. Next is a question for Katanya Raby from Cassandra Sneed. The question is, has there or will there be any opportunities for in-person community stakeholders? We know that not everyone is in the virtual space. Yes, that's a great question. And as I think Hubert 
um, expressed during his presentation, um, we will definitely have opportunities to meet in person. We understand the importance of providing a variety of options for people to connect with us. Um, so our next meeting, which the date has not yet been set for, um, and we will communicate that as soon as it is available, um, we do plan to meet in person for that meeting. Thank you. Uh, next for Dr. Kirk, it's a question from Kimberly Morris. It reads, is the community table advisory group only open to residents of the area? What about business owners or people who work or go to school in the study area? Well, uh, they the, the community table is primarily uh, focused on residents. Um, however, we will have others who can participate in connection to the community table uh, to make ensure that their voices and perspectives are engaged. And in fact, we're going to have uh, advisory uh, and support uh, elements connected to the community table that actually provide information and context for some of the, and many of the decisions that folks at the community table will have to listen to about and to make uh, some judgments on. So uh, we're not, there's no voice that shouldn't be heard, uh, but we're definitely given prominence to community residents in making those choices. Now, business owners have a really particular and important role on the corridor. So they could actually through associations or through as individuals could also engage with the table, but not necessarily be a direct member of it. Awesome, thank you. Tina, next question is from Chris White. It's a long one. Given that there are a lot, a lot of gaps in transit on the South side, what can an ETL, ETLD project do to fill gaps in transit? So it sounds like a transit question, but here's the second half. For example, what do we do when there is an ETLD project with less parking, but residents cannot dependently get, dependently get home from a second or third shift job on transit? And I hope you can hear why I think this is about HREIA. We can't hear you. She's muted. This one she's muted. Sorry about that, you all. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to answer this question, but for those of you um, in transit, if, if you want to add to that, please do. <clears throat> Your points are are specific to the reason why H the HRI process is important for this is understanding why one understanding what's driving some of those gaps, um, and and I think as a part of this project, we want to make sure that we are thoughtful about the fact that they exist and how they're impacting, you know, access to different things. So access to, to your jobs, how that, the, the, if there is a gap, then how do you get home? And how long does it take for you to get home? And what does that, what does that look like in just your day-to-day -day lived experience? And so how we will make sure that we pull that information through is understanding that the example that you just gave is, providing context for us in the impact, direct impact of that gap. And so in future planning, please make sure that you think, you know, that you take into consideration these types of things in this way. So I would say we want to make sure we hear that type of feedback from you and, and that, and from other residents, when you, if you have similar examples and similar experiences, please continue to provide that information to us so that we can understand what that lived experience is so that we pull those things through into the future the future plans. If there's anybody else, and I'll just kind of pause there, if there's anybody else that would like to add specifically on transit, if you would like to add to my response, please do. Yeah, Tina, I can jump in and give a much less yeah. eloquent answer than you just gave. Um, but <laughs> I, I would also just, refer back to the fact that these transit improvements are happening centralized on this corridor to help address some of those gaps. Obviously there are other gaps that will need to be addressed as well, but part of that ETOD vision is, is taking some of the trips that people do make about their regular life, whether it is to work or to get groceries or to meet appointments or even socially um, to help bring some of those amenities closer to home. So. Um, it, that's more of a long-term vision answer, but as we continue to see these planning processes uh, across the city, it would promote 
closing some of those gaps by just also shortening the distances that you would need to travel um, from your home or place of work to access things you need to do to go about your day. Great. Um, a, there's a question, two questions from Chris White. I'm going to ask that you were address these. One is how do I nominate others for the community table? And the second is would helping set up listening events with groups and churches be an option? So I'm not sure Chris White is offering to help or is suggesting that we set up listening groups with groups and churches as an option. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would love to respond to listening groups and uh, even give those listening groups an opportunity to not just listen, but to also share some of what they might want to bring to the meeting. Um, it's great that we can hear uh, what people's concerns are, but um, are, it's great that we can share things, but we need to hear what people's concerns are. So I would say that if you're going to set up a listening group for on our behalf, that it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Kimberly, could you just, the first question was? Um, how, how, do I, how do I nominate others for the community table? Great. Um, there's the criteria that I spoke about earlier that we have and will be sharing um, to the universe um, at the end of the meeting in the next day or two, where if you go to the website, you will be able to see what steps do I have to think about in order for me to say, is this person who I would like to recommend worthy of being able to sit on the community table? Do they live there? Do they sh sh show lo leadership qualities? Have they shown the type of leadership qualities in the past that would be able to benefit um, the community table over the course of this project? So if those answers are in the affirmative, then you can definitely recommend um, someone to, to sit here. Okay. I should also mention, if I can, that there are a couple seats that we have because we are so sensitive to the fact that we need a diversity of voices. Uh, we have been working over the summer with people who are returning residents, people who are finding it extremely hard to fold back into society as we, we know it. Um, and their voices also need to be heard. So there's uh, someone who have been recommended and they will have a seat at the, at the table to be able to give a perspective of people who, when they're coming back and re-entering society, what is it that they're looking for? Particularly if we're talking about um, having an equitable uh, community in which they can live. Thank you. Uh, this next question is from Kevin Tyson for Jasmine. What is the assessment process for determining the value for parcels that need to be vacated for redevelopment? Will it be market value? So uh, one, I want to clarify, we're not vacating, we're not proposing to vacate any occupied um, homes or spaces um, through this plan, but we are um, evaluating all of the vacant land and buildings throughout the corridor. Um, and part of that evaluation is actually um, title searches. So we have a number of some vacant properties and the owners are kind of absentee owners and we don't know who the owner is. So we're doing title searches for all of the properties. We are doing a market analysis of the land value. And then we are in, actually doing an environmental screening at a high level of all of the parcels along the corridor as well. So we just have a full kind of information or background on the land and the buildings available along the corridor. Thank you. This next question is for Katanya. It's from an anonymous attendee. It reads, as housing insecurity is expanding, how can we make connections between neighborhood stakeholders with organizers who want to eliminate abandoned properties and empty lots throughout the community? That's a great question. And I think that requires a bit more conversation than we have time for today. Um, but immediately I could say um, through the work that Far South CDC does, we do um, work with residents to um, prepare them for home ownership. So that's one space that we would 
work with community directly. Um, there are a number of programs out there that have um, that are newer where if community members are interested in being taking part in development opportunities, um, those programs do exist to kind of like, you know, at the very beginning stages of that. Um, and we have information about those resources. So if anyone is interested in learning about how they can connect with those types of organizations to learn about development, um, learn the process, um, you know, they can reach out and we can connect them to those sort those resources. Thank you, Katanya, and thank you to all of our speakers. We are going to prepare to close out. Katanya is going to close us out. Any questions unanswered will be documented and saved, and we will add them to the FAQ page on the website, chicago.gov slash 95th. So as we conclude this meeting uh, focused on equitable transit oriented development along 95th Street, I want to express my gratitude to each and every one of you for your valuable time, your ideas, your passion. Your presence here today underscores the strength of our community and our shared commitment to creating a more accessible and equitable future. We've heard a, derange, a, a diverse range of voices, ideas, concerns. And it is clear that it, this is a crucial conversation that needs to continue. Building ETOD is a long journey and we've just taken the first steps together. Your input, whether it's advocating for affordable housing, economic development opportunities, green spaces, or improved infrastructure is vital in shaping our collective vision. Equity means ensuring that every member of our community benefits from the opportunities and am amenities this project will bring. This journey will require collaboration, dialogue, and innovation, but I'm confident that we will have the, de the determination and creativity needed to make it happen. Let us remember that every step forward is a step toward a better future for everyone who calls the communities around 95th Street home. We are united by our common goal of creating a thriving and inclusive community where transit is accessible, housing is affordable, and economic opportunities are abound. Your involvement and commitment are the driving force behind this vision. I encourage all of you to stay engaged by registering online at, at chicago.gov backslash 95th. Be sure to join the community table and the 95th Street ETOD plan advisory group. Attend the next public meeting in person in the next couple months, we will get that date to you as soon as we have it. Um, and that meeting will focus on the existing conditions and also uh, the HREIA process. Again, that date will be announced soon. So, and also please follow us on Instagram at 95th Street Plan. So that's at 95THSTPLAN. And any frequently asked questions that have come through this presentation or otherwise, uh, we will develop a one page document that will um, contain the answers to those questions and that will be made available soon online, as well as a recording of this webinar. The success of equitable transit oriented development depends on all of us working together. Our city's future is bright and it's within our grasp to ensure that it shines for all. Thank you for your time and your passion and dedication to a more equitable 95th Street, and together we can make this vision a reality. So have a good night, and let's keep the momentum going. Take care, everyone. Thank you.